I'm going to thank our first keynote speaker yesterday, Professor Hans Rosling, for actually setting us on our right track of trying to understand society before we understand the technology that we try to bring to bear on society. You know, as an engineer who's become a social scientist uh, and in the process of minister handling politics, I've had to see water and the problems of water not just from the technical side, but also from the social side where things really go wrong. Technical problems we can solve. I think, I think we've got greater capacity to solve technical problems than we have to solve uh, social problems where things come apart. Even the best of technologies do not really work when society does not accept it. In my experience, there are three basic problems, speciality of water. First, barring the promise of desalinization, which has not crossed the energy barrier yet, water, unlike energy, cannot be manufactured. In most places in the world, we just have to live with what is there. At best, we can transport it in very clever ways, but in the Himalaya, we can't even do that. It's just the heights are too great. The energy cost is too high. The second is water is life, and it's linked to just about everything else. I've always joked that water is a subject of every department in a university, not just the physical sciences, but right up to literature. So water has to be dealt by everything. It also means that water has a very long history, uh, and history is what determines our institutions. So when you try to intervene into water, you are intervening and disturbing, in a sense, institutions of various types with long memories and sometimes even longer knives. And that's where all the water projects come to grief, and we haven't learned how to handle that properly. This brings me to the third point, the specificity of water. And this is very critical in the institution and politics of water, which is water needs harvesting. Energy is often mined, petroleum, coal, and so on. Yes, there's a thin sliver of renewables that are harvested, but water needs harvesting, and what harvesting means it means it has to have constant socio-systemic involvement. Mining means you can take your seventh fleet, you can take your army, surround an area, and just take out anything you want. You can't do that with water. You have to work with society. You have to work with them every year, season to season, flood to drought, and so on and so forth. And to this kind of water and to the institutions that manage this water, something is happening. It's un what, is, what is happening is it's coming under great stress, you know, and most of that stress is often socially generated. Yes, there is climate change, but if you ask me as a minister from one of the southern countries, uh, what we used to be called third world is politically no longer correct to say that, I would say that climate change, yeah, it's interesting to talk in international forum but it really has no impact on any decision making at national level, at political national levels, uh, because too many other social issues override any concerns of climate change and other things. They're important, yes, but you know, when you have a place where there's no scarcity of water and there's a riot in a town, you're not really worried about climate change. You're worried about the social consequences. I'll give you an example. We did a study once to see what uh, the models, different global models of climate change are doing in Nepal Himalaya. And we found interesting. There's no doubt temperature is rising. Strangely, it's rising in the higher, faster, the higher altitude than the lower altitude. But on precipitation, there's absolute uncertainty. And these models, these global models, all of them, they showed that precipitation in Nepal Himalaya could decrease by minus 53% or increase by up to 135%. Now, if you were a minister like me, what would you do? If the opposition was raising hell about climate change, I would say, well, it's going to increase by 135%, so why are you worried? If I needed to scare somebody, I would say you're going to decrease by 50%. Well, that's how politics operates, and thank you, climate scientists. Now, I'm going to put before you two counterintuitive ideas in the same line that 
Professor Hans Roslin did it yesterday so effectively. The first I'm going to argue with you is there is no such thing as urban and rural. We've grown up thinking, well, this is urban development and this is rural development. But given that in most places, in countries like mine that we come from, a generation back, maybe 10 to 15% of the people lived in urban areas, so-called urban areas. A generation hence, we're going to have 60 to 80% of the people living in urban areas, what I call urban areas. In social terms, do you think that shift automatically makes them, you know, suave urbanites? No, they bring all their rural habits with them into very, very congested urban areas. And that behavior is going to determine their water behavior, their water needs, their demand on water, their attitude to water, and so on. The second point I'm going to make, the counterintuitive one, is that there is no such thing as an organization. I can already see you saying, what? I'll argue that there are only four basic different styles of organizing. And each one of these styles of organizing is basically trying to destabilize the other styles. Now, if you look at this picture that's up on the screen, this is a Pakistani lady in Lahore selling strawberries on a donkey cart using mobile phones. And the backdrop are 13th, 14th century pre-Mughal Mughal ruins against the backdrop of high transmission tower, high, high electricity transmission, high voltage towers. You could not be getting a better example of spanning technology across time, space, and cultures. Now, is this lady rural? Is she urban? What is she? This is just across the border on the other side in India, in some of the areas, the dry areas of the deserts of Rajasthan and Gujarat that we are working on. And you think you see a truck. Unfortunately, it's not a truck. It looks like a truck. It quacks like a truck. But it's not a truck. It's an irrigation pump. The story is very interesting. The Indian Development Bank, Rural Development Bank of the Government of India, gives farmers very cheap loans to buy three horsepower pumps for irrigation. The trouble is farmers pawn their wives' jewelries to add their own money and get a 10 horsepower pump. And all the engineers and economists in the bank say the farmers are stupid. They could do with three horsepower where they're pawning their wives' jewelries to get a 10 horsepower pump. And, so, and then you find out that a three horsepower pump would only pump water for 3,000 hours a year out of the 8,000 something hours, whereas a 10 horsepower pump after doing all the irrigation pumping, can be fitted onto a chassis and transport goods and repay loans within two years that you would not be able to do otherwise. It's the farmers who are very smart. It's the engineers who are stupid. Now, this kind of a counterintuitive example actually shows that it comes from something that we are not used to thinking. We think in these two binary terms. The reality is we have something like this. And the word desakota comes from Bhasha Indonesia. And it's a, these are Sanskritic words, actually, of origin. It basically means desa, country, like Bangladesh, rural, and kota, center of the town. So desakota is something used by some of us researchers to refer to something that's neither rural nor urban. Now, you go to Nepal, three days in a village, walking from the last road, three days, and if you take a very high view, you'll see, yes, it's rural, of course, three days of walking, you know, uh, without roads. But if you look at the household income of that farmer there, you'll probably find that the farmer's 40% income comes from rural sources, and 60% of his income is probably coming, of that household, is coming from London, Dubai, Malaysia. Why? Because a member of the family is out there earning you know, money in one of these centers and sending money back. Is that farmer rural or urban? Well, 60% urban, 40% rural, even three days walking from the last roadhead. A study like this was done in Pakistan by some of us. Quetta, Baluchistan, the badlands of Pakistan, Taliban area. You suddenly find out that there are two villages on two sides of that big city, 
And what these lines show you is declining urban influences and declining rural traditional values and influences. And that middle sector where they intersect is basically the point of Desakota. It's an institutional vacuum. But it's also an institutional incubation area where that truck, irrigated truck that you saw, happens. It's, an, it's a very fertile area where people experiment and do things. And important there is the informal economy. So we talk of the private sector very often, but at gatherings like this, when we talk of the private sector, we mean big multinational companies. Well, the informal economy is all private, very private. It's very much at the household level. And this is where much of the conflict lies when development agencies try to push privatization. In the process, they're only pushing big multinational companies, ignoring completely the private sector that actually exists on the ground and is doing some pretty creative things. Back in Nepal, the choice of technology, and I'm making that second argument. Here on the left, you see, is the traditional way irrigation is done in Nepali hills. 80% of all irrigation is still done that way by brushwood dams. End of the monsoon, dry season starts, farmers get together cooperatively, you know, put off the brushwood dam. It provides a second and even third crop very cheaply. Come the monsoon again, the dam gets washed off. It's a disposable dam. Traditional technology, very environmentally friendly. But there's a problem. Labor is short. People are migrating out to Gulf countries for labor and all. So it's very difficult to get voluntary labor. So what happens? The managers of the system want simple help that would counterbalance their lack of labor. So they come to engineers like me in a department of irrigation or something. And we have only learned cement technology. We were never taught brushwood dams. We don't even know whether brushwood dams exist. So what do we do? We build a big dam like this on the same river a bit further down. Well, the problem was this dam was built in 1961, and in 1962, the river moved away, leaving the dam high and dry, a monument to man's stupidity, or engineer's stupidity. Now, the funny part is, that's the, that's the comedy. The tragedy part is, we had carved up a farmer-managed system below, and when the dam did not work, there was no water down below, because we destroyed the old, and our new did not work. So the area degenerated into being a duckweed-infested area as people had to do anything to survive. Their livelihoods of irrigation gone. Much like the Somali farmers whose waters got so polluted that they could not fish anymore, and so they started fishing for oil tankers. Same thing. However, another technology came in. This is voluntary technology of communities. This is agency-managed specialized technology of us engineers from departments of government. And this is the market that came in. You notice it's the humble diesel pump. There are 60 million or something like that all over India, it's said. And it's even fitted right next to this hand pump. And it provides water. If you can't afford a pump like this, you can rent one for 50 rupees an hour, and it'll come to you on a bullock cart. Now, suddenly, you see that the choice of technology and which technology you use is very much dependent on what kind of institution is there on the ground. A community technology, an agency technology of cement, or a market technology of something else. I'm arguing this because we have a problem. And the problem is this. There are two types of sciences from the social science perspective. A toad's eye science and an eagle eye science. Of course, eagle eye science with satellite data and GIS positioning, it's all very sexy. Everybody wants to study that. The trouble is you've got to do some towards eye science to see how water is actually managed by the people down there, and they're doing some pretty creative things. Okay. Now, this cartoon here was drawn by a cartoonist in the Mekong when I was giving a talk. And there's a phenomenon in high mountain areas of Nepal, Tibet, and also in Colorado. It's a phenomenon that it's so high up there, it's so low pressure, and so dry, it's a desert, that you have thunder and lightning, you can drive towards it, a column of water is descending down a rain, but the trouble is not a drop of rain hits the ground. Why? Because it evaporates before it hits the ground. There's a name for this phenomenon, meteorological phenomenon. I find it very symbolic 
in talking about Millennium Development Goals, climate change, and all these things that we are all concerned about at the national and international level, they're like drops of rain that never hit the ground. You go talk to any farmer in India, Nepal, Africa, I'll bet, you know, nobody's even heard of MDGs, you know, the Millennium Development Goals. I'm, and most people have maybe heard of climate change, but all that it means to them was yesterday was hot, today is cold. Nobody relates it to CO2 and the changing behavior necessary. Well, the argument I'm making is we need both eagle eye science and towards eye science. Unfortunately, we are doing too little towards eye science when it comes to water. And that's where the problem lies. Groundwater overdraft, a big problem in India, big problem in many parts of the world. The social response to groundwater overdraft that you can see is very clear. On the one side, you have the market. You have this guy who's got money, he puts in a pump, high-powered pump, pumps away the water, and the groundwater table declines so much that all his neighbor's pumps go dry. The response immediately is the government type over here says, I, you know, we got to have more rules and regulations. The activist egalitarian here is probably the angry young man who thinks the government is stupid and the neighbor is greedy. These are all environmental activists and social activists. And of course, you have the poor, fatalized voter and consumer doesn't know what to do. The next option for him is to migrate to the slums of urban areas. Okay. If you leave the fatalists out for a while, you end up with what I call a three-legged policy stool. You have three types of organizing styles. You have bureaucratic hierarchism, you have market individualism, and you have activist egalitarianism. All three exist right from the village commons to the national level to the global commons. You know, I would almost be tempted to say at this point that you, know, you have IWA over here, you have IRC, International River Commissions, over here, and the International Rivers Network Activist Group over here. That's a temptation. You see that they, make, they have a very different perception of what risk is. We talk a lot in this conference about risk, but risk from a social science perspective is socially constructed. And different entities have a very different perception of risk. Market people are risk takers. Activists are risk sensitizers. Governments are risk managers. And this is a very different way of doing business. You also see the choice from the previous diagram, the graph uh, pictures I showed you, that the choice of an agency of technology is modern cement technology. The choice of markets, they do some of the most creative things, market people, very clever things, diesel pump, donkey cart, mobile phone, strawberry selling, irrigated truck. And then you have the community, which does brushwood dams and is concerned more about equity and so on. You see that three different types of power is being exercised by these three different entities. You have hierarchies, coercive power. It's based on procedural, I would even say fetishism, make more rules, make more things, uh, procedures. And if that is violated, you know, put people in jail, do whatever. Coercive power, bureaucratic coercive power. You have markets, persuasive power. It's the networking, the freedom, you know, the contracting, the creative ideas. Come on, you know, just remove the constraints and we'll, you know, invent our way out of the problem. Okay. And egalitarianism is the moral power, the strategy of critique, you know. And that's what, you know, gets them, you know, there, they riles them up all the time. My last slide, I mean, if you put this together, put the three together, leave the fate list out at one point, you will see that the definition of what the water problem is differs very much from the solidarities that you're dealing with. You know, bureaucratic hierarchism, because they're, so, they're control freaks, what they will say is, you know, you've got to get more controls in. You know, this is the politics it generates. We like to call it the Nehruvian politics. It's the regulatory management solution. And their beloved social science is law. You come to market, and they believe in free innovation. They think resources are abundant, whereas the previous ones thought resources are scarce. You know? And we can invent our way out of the problem. And liberal economics is what they like. Efficiency is what they talk about. You know? And then you come to the third leg of the stool the activists, the egalitarians, the movements, the greens, you know. And to them, resource degradation is the critical problem. And it gives rise to a very Gandhian politics, the previous market one being a Reagan, Reagan, Reagan or Thatcherite politics. You know, Mahatma Gandhi's famous statement, 
the world has enough for our needs, but not enough for our greed. It's a classic egalitarian statement. And the social sciences they love here is critical anthropology. It's about reciprocal equity. So the point is, if you are talking about a water problem, these three entities define the water problem very differently. They see the problem differently. It's not the same definition of the problem. And if your definition of the problem is different, you can bet your boots your solutions are going to be even more different. Now, what does this lead us to? In light of the uncertainties that we have, climate change, the social uncertainties that we are seeing all around us and all, what we need to do and think is to be more, more humble with our solutions, first of all. Admit that the other guy's point might be right. And come forth with constructive engagement. There are very few polities, statesmen like polities, where people are brought together on a constructive engagement platform. More often than not, what we have is a flying apart, an impasse. Many water projects are completely stuck because these three different social solidarities can't even get together on the same table and talk. It's not enough just to bring them to a table. They must also be responded to. So this is where constructive engagement comes. And because each one is proffering a very different definition of the problem and proffering very different solutions, the way out would be to have many 10% solutions on the table rather than to have one perfectly optimized solution that we are all taught as engineers and economists to go for. This brings me to the core conclusion I'm making. And this is this. We're here in Portugal and somebody mentioned to me that there's this wonderful foundation here called Gulbenkian Foundation. This foundation brought out a very interesting book in 19, the book came out from Stanford University Press in 1996. It's called Open the Social Sciences. It was, headed, it was a commission headed by Emmanuel, the eminent uh, economist Immanuel Wallerstein. It had Ilya Prigozhin, the Nobel Prize winning chemist, and so on, 10 very eminent people. And what they argue is that the social sciences as have developed currently into different disciplines, economics, political science, anthropology, sociology, law, and so on and so forth, area studies, these all developed for very specific purposes in five locales of Europe and America. And they conclude they are next to useless for countries like ours in the South. We need more integrated social sciences, which, means it, which has not been found yet, but it's an exciting journey ahead. What, I, what this leads me to is to argue that we first of all need more toad's eye science, more grassroots based understanding of what is happening out there and to be able to project that understanding to a higher policy level. Unfortunately, what we have is too much very eagle eye science and a ramming down of solutions down everybody's throats down there and it just doesn't work because people start throwing up. You know, and there are protest movements, there are impasse, there is conflict, and so on. So we need more towards our science. We also need to accept plural and contradictory definitions of the problem at the same time. What this means is that innovations for solutions and innovations to emerge, we have to find managerial solutions up here, regulatory and managerial solutions, they have to come. We have to find technical solutions over here, clever devices and so on. But we also have to find very, very interesting solutions of behavioral change, value changes. And these are the people who have to do it over here at this third leg. So that is the core conclusion that I draw, that we need to meet the new challenges of water. We need new managers of water, not just civil engineers and economists. We also need other disciplines to come in who can listen to and respond to the different definitions of what the water problem is. Thank you. Thank you.